All right, AGP, we're ready to start. Are we rolling? Mic's on. All right, thank you. Um, welcome, today is September 7th. The 7th, 7th, it's 5.30 p.m., we're in the Vets Hall. Uh, today is the meeting of the Harbor Advisory Board. Uh, we'd like to go ahead and call the meeting with a uh, roll call. We'll go ahead and start uh, on the other side of the, side of the room. Uh, Jean? Here. Sean? Here. Go over here, Mary? Here. Uh, Chris? Here. And then uh, two members are not here at the moment, Lori French and Sharice Hansen. Does that work for roll call, Lori? Okay, cool. Uh, next on the agenda is we'll um, do a moment of silence. Thank you. Next up is the Pledge of Allegiance. Go ahead and scan. I guess I'll uh, start us off for I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, a nation under God, indivisible, justice for all. All right. All right. Next on the agenda is we'll start with uh, liaison and public outreach. Uh, We'll go over and start with Jean, member Howdy. Excuse me. Yeah, the bay is completely full of life right now. There are so much um, anchovies and pelicans and seagulls. It's just fun to watch. And seals, um, there's so much life out there that's just fun to see. Normally we see all our anchovies showing up June, July, maybe August, but this is September and we're seeing them just come in right now and thick. So it's fun to watch. All right, thank you, uh, Member Green. Uh, people probably know this, but uh, or they might not. Uh, Cal Poly is uh, starting uh, yeah, roughly a week later than usual, so um, there might be some influx of uh, parents uh, eat, eating along the waterfront I around September, you know, 16 to 22, as opposed to uh, maybe a week earlier in uh, during no normal school year. So, just want to pass that along. Um, I believe there's going to be one more uh, year at Cal Poly uh, under the quarter system, which is mid-September to mid-June. Uh, there's, they're convert, uh, well, we, I guess, are converting to a semester system uh, in 2025, uh, which will push uh, students into, uh, into Slow County in mid-August instead of mid-September, and they will depart mid-May instead of mid-June, uh, starting here in a couple years. All right, thank you. Um, Mary? All right, I had um, two announcements that I don't want to steal Chris's thunder, but uh, Maritime Family Fun Day is planned for October 14th at the Mora Bay Maritime Museum from 10 to 2. Last year's event was awesome for families, and it's a free event, so highly recommend. In addition to that, the Morro Bay Rot Rotary Club is also doing the Morro Bay Rotary Ducky Derby, as they did last year. Um, I think they're 50% of the way to their goal of um, 1,000 ducks sold. So um, go to morrobayrotary.org to buy your ducks for that event. Um, and you don't need to be present to win the duck derby. All right, thank you, Mary. Um, I'll let Chris go next. Well, we have survived the uh, El uh, San Salvador incident, as I'm calling it. Um, the Spanish gallon, galleon from the 1500s came to town, and uh, with a great system of volunteers, we put about 10,500 people on the boat in 10 days. How we did that, I can't tell you. It was a blur in hindsight. We're all exhausted. Uh, there's some money in the bank, and it, just a tremendous amount of goodwill. Uh, it, it brought locals out. It brought people in from out of town who didn't know what was happening and couldn't miss it. Uh, a great time was had by all. And the next function, the next uh, the fun day at the museum in September is a must. It's just everything from Sandcastle Building to the Salinan Indian showing up, teaching kids how to make bracelets. It's wide open. Uh, 
plus those fisher people, you know, they bring fish and food. So, so. come on out. Thanks. Right, Lori, any member announcements? You can pass if you want to. Well, I apologize for being late. I'm sorry I got held up at work. We'll discuss that later. Yeah, that, that, that nine to five job, you know. Um, just an FYI, um, we have lost two well-respected fishermen, um, Fred Ronaldi and Mike McCorkle. Mike was from Santa Barbara, but he served on everything, and Fred was from Morro Bay, and we are gonna miss them horribly. All right, thank you. Um, the one big announcement, or biggest of the two, is the Tidelands, Tunes at the Tidelands will be uh, Thursday afternoons at the Tidelands Park this month, so that'll be fun. Looking forward to missing today's, but uh, to next week's I'll pick it up, so uh, go there if you'd like to. Um, just wanna key off of the uh, San Salvador, I did get the chance to be a uh, docent on there. It was, it was really fun. The cutest story, so I'll keep it short, is little family, little kid, about seven, pirate's costume, he didn't want off the ship, I was working the gangplank, he was like almost crying, holding on, his mom's finally getting him to come off, I welcomed him ashore, pirate, he was happy with that, and then his mom apologized and said, oh, he just didn't want to leave, and I said, I know, that's why I'm a docent. <laughs> so, my cute story. Um, uh, with that, we'll go ahead and move on to the um, next uh, agenda item. Uh, again, we have a presentation from Dana McClish from the Moral Bear Yacht Club. If you want to come up to the uh, microphone, I think you have to turn it on. Button on the bottom, it says push. I don't know if it's the same mic. Right here. Do you would think I would know how to do it. I would just on that side. Oh, there's one right here. Buttonless. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your service. Uh, I am Dana McClish, and I've been a member of the Royal Bay Yacht Club for some years now, over 25. And um, I was asked to speak a little bit about the Yacht Club uh, from my friend Mary, who's a new member. And the Yacht Club's been around for about 67 years. At one point it was floating, and so it would move around different spots. But you can find all that out if you go to mbyc.net and look on the, hit the history button, and it's got great stories and some great photos. Um, the present building was built in 1979, 1980, it was dedicated. It was built by all volunteer uh, members uh, doing all the work. And we've done quite a few improvements since then also uh, uh, with the building and with the, uh, the gangway, the tarmac, the dock, uh, and the galley, the bathrooms. So the, um, the Yacht Club is the official city of Morro Bay host for transients. And we average about 250 transients a year, uh, sometimes more. Um, this time of year, we have a lot of people transiting down to Mexico from the Baja Jaja, which is a, a big event started by Latitude 38 up in San Francisco. And we'll see some of those people back in the spring as they return, and some of them just keep going. So uh, we enjoy that part of our water lease. We have six moorings that are designated strictly for transients. And then we also have the dock. Uh, we have a lot of sailing events throughout the year, ocean boats, uh, ocean races, and bay races, usually twice a month for each. We like to keep it that way. Our junior events, same thing. We usually piggyback off the bay races so that we can schedule those with favorable tidal uh, occurrences. Um, so, some of the bigger events we have, we have uh, Cal Poly uh, is part of our club. We facilitate Cal Poly sailing. We own all the boats. 
and we let them use the facilities and our launches, and they're just wonderful kids. Um, the uh, Mustang Regatta is held usually in late February, so it's, it's kind of nice because they use that area down by the launch ramp, and nobody's there. Nobody's fishing, nobody, it's usually, this year we had hail, so it, it's, it's a good time for them to hold that event. And then right after that, we have the Big Rock Regatta, which is the smallest boats that we sail in our junior program, the Optimist, and that's part of the Southern California Youth Yacht Racing Association carry series, and so there's uh, five other yacht clubs in Southern California that also participate in that event, and we've had up to 91 boats and sailors and families and coaches at our club for that, for that event, and that's in March. This year, next year it'll be St. Patrick's Day weekend. Um, let's see, after that we have, uh, we have the Zongo Cup in late summer. That's after we have our summer sailing lessons, which we, is a community outreach program that we do for uh, adults and kids. We call it eight to 80 is the age. Um, we get a lot of junior uh, signups out of that program. And our junior program runs all year long. It's about twice, twice a month also. And uh, it's a really, really good program. It's pretty strong right now. Uh, it's part of what keeps our yacht club going is having junior program. Uh, the, um, the other things we do, we host uh, like the Coast Guard at our building for their meetings. Um, we, um, we also, um, we, we, we have a, a lease with the yard across the street so that we can have all our small boats. Most commonly would be our day sailors and those are um, particularly well suited for Morro Bay with a kick up center board and so we have a lot of races with those. We have Day Sailor Invitational and, and things like that, but we also use those boats for our summer sailing uh, program. So it's real natural for people to come right into uh, an active fleet in our club. Uh, like I said, it's an all volunteer club. Um, it's uh, kind, of, kind of a big family. And uh, I'm sure some of you may not have been there, but I think most of you have at one time or another. And uh, we hope that uh, you're able to come back again. Um, we have some upcoming events that I'd like to, that you mentioned. And uh, I'm just gonna hold up these flyers. This is actually part of the Maritime Museum, but we work with them on a few different events like the swap meet in June and then the upcoming Family Fun Day. So on Wednesday, be two weeks before that, they're having this Rock the Waterfront so don't want to miss that. It's a big fundraiser for the Maritime Museum. And then the Family Fun Day during October, which is the official City of Morro Bay um, Maritime Historic Month. And so we have a few events going on there. And we're gonna be part of this. We have our junior program will be down there through our foundation. We have a Morro Bay Youth Sailing Foundation that will have a booth They'll have a boat there for kids to see, lots of information. We have a, uh, a fun event or project for them. We have what's called gutter boats. We have these gutters set up and they make boats and then they race each other in, the, in those uh, half pipes, that's what they are. And um, so make sure you go to that, that's a really fun one. And then one more that we're putting on for the first time and that is our junior alumni reunion. And this is for anybody that ever sailed as a youth down at the Yacht Club. I mean, we have some old timers that before we had junior programs that uh, we've contacted. It's been a lot of work just contacting people. So this is gonna be a big event. We got a luau, we have spectacular si silent auction items already. So I'm just gonna hold up a few photos kind of showing people out there in the audience um, some of the 
activities that we have. Would have liked to do the, done this on a slideshow, but this is my low-tech version. These are the day sailors. We also have events for just about everybody in our club. We have fun floaters. Sometimes these are people that used to sail and are now kayaking and, and just anybody who has a day off on a Thursday. <laughs> um, here are some of our Opti sailors from the Big Rock. And then we also have Cal Poly sailing here in the Mustang Regatta. And then we had, uh, we also hosted nationals for Santa Cruz 27s last year. And so here they are taking up our dock. And we are always willing to do those types of events through our club. Um, we're just having a great time. So you can look us up on mbyc.net and you can find out a whole lot more information, our monthly newsletters, our webcam, which is really good to look at the bay, see what the see what's going on, and uh, thank you for your service. All right, thank you, Dana. Uh, any questions uh, for the for Dana? Barry? Yeah, I just wanted to thank you for coming, Dana, and also um, I don't think you explicitly mentioned, but thank you as a former HAB member for the service that you've done here as well. Thank you. Any other questions for Dana? Go ahead, Gene. Yeah, hey Dana, thanks for all your years at years sitting here next to me. <laughs> I, I miss you. Um, did a member just recently re return from a circumnavigation of the world? Yeah, let's see. We had one who passed away, and that was Duncan McQueen. Right. But recently, I'm trying to remember, it seems like we did. Uh, I'm sorry? The West Sail 32. Oh, right. They're actually not members. Not yet. <laughs> we also have members that are cruising right now. We did have some members who came back and they made it uh, all the way to Australia and back. And they spent a lot of time in Fiji and the islands there. Um, but uh, yeah, we have members that are out there cruising, definitely. It's uh, a great place to call home. but. Great place to travel from too. Yeah, when you go around the world, you come back here. Yeah, exactly. Any more questions? All right, no, thank you, Dana. I appreciate thank you your very time. Much. Thanks. All right, that concludes the presentation. Uh, next on the agenda is we'll move to uh, public comment. Again, this is uh, members of the audience that wish to address the HAB on Harbor Business. Uh, it's not on the agenda, can do so at this time. I believe we have a couple of folks that may want to step up here in the audience. Come on forward. You have three minutes, sir. Just real quick. Sure. Uh, my name is John Hobdahl. I'm the rear commodore for the Yacht Club. Um, I'm a local resident. Um, I have a Santa Cruz 27 sailboat that I keep in the mass up storage down behind the Maritime Museum. And because it's, I'm able to keep it there, um, I can keep the mast up and I can, you know, sail pretty regularly that way. Otherwise, if I had to take the mast down every time I sail, it'd be really difficult. Um, the reason I came up is I, I too was a docent on the San Salvatore the first day and you guys brought that up and I just want to say I, I had a blast doing that. I'd never done it before, but it was great. It was fun. I'm always fascinated with the old sailboats and stuff and it was just a really good time and I just wanted to add my two cents regarding that. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, any other public comment? Thank you. So uh, I'm Sherry Hafer, um, I'm wife of a commercial fisherman, Tom, for 37 years. I am the secretary of the Center Coast Women for Fisheries and the Morro Bay Lease Area Mutual Benefit Corporation, or MBC. I'm here to request the city of Morro Bay to sign a resolution supporting the encouragement of the three Morro Bay wind developers to join the MBC. Can you hear me okay? <coughs> I want to prefix these comments with the fact that we think offshore wind farms are a horrible idea and we do not want them. I only have a few minutes or I could go on forever on the reasons why it is a bad idea. However, California's priorities are what they are and again, the fishermen will likely get the short end of the stick 
So we have worked hard to be prepared as much as possible for the inevitable. On August of 2016, Red Davis told the fishermen the city was considering leasing the intake tunnel to Castle Wind for their cables, but wanted to be sure there was a fisherman's agreement that the fishermen agreed would mitigate for the impacts of an offshore wind farm off our coast, which at the time was only 120 miles. On November 29th, 2018, the City of Morro Bay Council passed a resolution to enter into a community benefits agreement with Castle Wind, which included an agreement, acknowledgement of the Fisherman's Agreement that was executed October 6, 2018. In November 2022, Castle Wind and the Fisherman's Organizations advanced the provisions of the 2018 Fisherman's Agreement and establish a legal entity, the Morro Bay Lease Area Mutual Benefits Corporation, or MBC. The Fisherman's Agreement took seven years, hundreds of meetings, and $170,000 at least in legal fees to finalize. <clears throat> the MBC was set up with a supervising board and also a trustee committee with seven commercial fishermen, one commercial, commercial passenger fishing vessel rep, and the three wind developer representatives who will have the responsibility of managing the funds, communications, and other required responsibilities of both industries. It is an industry to industry agreement separate from state and federal requirements, just like the fiber optic cable agreement. <clears throat> the NBC Community Benefit Fund will be used to promote the sustainability of the fishing community similar to how the funds from the Central Coast Fisheries Cable Liaison Committee have utilized their mitigation funds for the past 20 years. For example, those funds were used for safety equipment that included radars, radios, pumps, EPIRBs, alarms, GPS, AIS, life rafts, and life raft repacks, an ice machine, gear storage equipment and maintenance, Morro Bay and Port San Luis infrastructure repair and maintenance, the Those Who Wait sculpture, and interpretive fishery signs. For Central Coast Women for Fisheries, supportive fishing organizations, scholarships, the Junior Lifeguard Program, and other funds that support the sustainability of the fishing fleet. Because Castle Wind did not secure a lease, the fishermen currently have no mitigation in place. The state is requiring a working group to meet for, for two years and come up with guidelines for mitigation, but that won't be done until 2026. The Morro Bay Lease Area site surveys are scheduled to begin next year, sometime in March. This uh, these require high density sonic surveys of 195 to 203 decibels of pinging every 10 seconds for several weeks. Finfish max threshold is 120 decibels before ear damage and other behavioral impacts occur. The Ocean Wind 1 off New Jersey sonic study is about the same size as the as one Morro Bay lease area and required 610 exposure hours and 229 miles of large vessel travel. To date, 71 whales have mysteriously died since they began doing their studies. There is no doubt these studies will have an impact on the fish behavior and at least displace fishermen from fishing grounds. Fishmen should be mitigated before this starts. The only way that will happen is if the three wind developers join the NBC in the near future. California legislatures are working on a mitigation law that would support the NBC, SB 286. It says that the state will recognize locally negotiated industry to industry mitigation agreements. Fishing representatives had three lengthy meetings with the Morro Bay Lease Area Wind Developers asking for them to consider the mitigation plan we developed with Castle Wind. To date, they refuse. Their idea of mitigations is a communications plan and guard duty. 
So we are asking the city of Morro Bay to do what the prior council was willing to do to support their fishermen and sign a resolution that encourages the three Morro Bay Wind Project developers to become members of the NBC, to contribute to the fund for the benefit of the Central Coast fishing industry and to implement inter-industry communications, coordination, cooperation before the site surveys begin in early 2024. I have a copy of the resolution we would like the city to sign for you to review. Also, I can get you reference articles for any statements I made in these comments. Thank you. Thank you, oh. appreciate that. Any other public comments? Thank you. Sure. Go ahead, sir. Hi, um, my name is Tom Hafer. I am the president of the Marble Bay Fishing Organization. And everything that Sherry just told you is 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 completely true and is it's been a real pain for the fishermen in Morro Bay. Um, it also includes Port San Luis fishermen. There's about 150 commercial fishermen between the two ports. It took us seven years to get this proposal where Total, that was supposed to get a lease area, they would accept it. That's one of the biggest wind companies in the world and energy companies in the world. They didn't get the lease. They didn't bid high enough. So we're kind of stuck with this and we're trying to, you know, set it forward to the three wind companies that did win the leases. But like Sherry says, they, they've promised, them, promised us things. They haven't fulfilled those promises. They said they would speak to our council. They have not spoke to our council. Um, you know, it's going on since the first meeting with the three wind companies, it's it's about, I'd say four months now. We do have another wind company meeting, the 12th. We've decided to opt out of that meeting, all the fishermen that are involved in this, um, because they just won't, they won't keep their promises. So why should we go to their meetings and they want us to sign some communication agreement that gives them the upper hand. Why would we even do that if they're not even listening to what we've proposed in our, in our proposal? So, you know, it's, it was really hard to get this thing to all the fishermen to agree with this. And this is all inclusive of all the fishermen in California that have fished out in these waters where the call area is. So it's, it's for the whole state of California, not just the Avila and Morro Bay guys. And it was a tough, tough thing to do to speak with other fishermen and get their ideas and put everything together and all the lawyer fees we had to pay and all the thousands of meetings we went to. So just so you guys know, because I don't know if all you, all you, you know, everybody in Morro Bay knows what's really going on with the wind companies, but we've been working on it for the last seven years, trying to get something concrete with them before the site survey. That's the most important thing. When the site survey starts, we know from the cable people when they were here and they were doing their site surveys, it caused an impact. Fish quit biting for a couple of years. So they they mitigated us with, with money. And then we started the cable a liaison office, which, you know, we get a few hundred thousand dollars every year from the cable committee from the cable companies. And this is a thousand times worse than that. I mean, the, the size that they're gonna use for the, for the pinging, it, it's gonna kill everything. And you know, when they were doing the Diablo thing, that when they wanted to do the seismic testing on that, fishing game in the state of California shut them down because they knew it was gonna be a big problem. But for some reason, they're just gonna let them do it. So. We're pretty worried about it. I think everybody in Morro Bay should be worried about it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, I appreciate your time. Um, any other public comments here in the audience? 
AGP, is there anybody on the phone? Thank you, Chair Myers. There are currently no raised hands in the queue. All right, thank you. Any questions or comments about the uh, public comment? Yeah, I just wanted to thank you both the last comments for um, sharing that. And with me personally, I have experience um, on naval vessels and absolutely understand what you're saying about the impact of those sonar pings on um, the sea life. So um, definitely spoke to me personally and I will absolutely do what I can to pass on that sentiment to our um, HAB liaison um, and talk to her about the potential impacts that that could have on the commercial fishing industry, which not only your industry, but I think commercial fishing is part of the charm and character that also allows our tourism industry to be so successful as well. So I really appreciate that. Thank you, Mary. Any other comments? Questions? Go ahead, Jean. Sure, I'm just gonna say a hardcore thank you. Uh, Tom, sorry. Oh. Thanks for coming for bringing it to you. I've got lots of questions. I heard something on the radio this morning about federal funding and how a lot of it is being deferred from other um, agencies towards this wind farm thing here. And so it's kind of curious because one of the agencies they are deleting funding for was saving the whales. So it's kind of a roundabout way of killing the whales. So <laughs> Um, but I have lots of other questions. I'll sit down and talk to you when we days on your boat. All right. Yeah. Sounds good, Gene. Okay. Yeah, as a chairperson, I, again, I appreciate you guys coming out. I know we've mm -hmm. chatted in the past. Um, this is sort of the first step for us to bring awareness to the city council. Um, we want to help. Uh, we just have to kind of, it has to go through the various avenues to the city. And, and I believe we have a, uh, this council's had a lot on their plates. And I think we, you guys bringing the awareness like you have. Um, we'll help raise that at the city council and then uh, eventually we can help as well as best we can. So again, we really appreciate your time. Yeah, we should probably give the same talk to the city council. I would strongly encourage that. Yeah. And so, yeah, the next council meeting, you can do the same thing. So I uh, yeah. like, yeah, strongly encourage that. So again, thank you. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. So it's our anniversary tonight, so we're gonna go out to dinner. Oh yeah. Yay. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Lord. All right. Uh, next up is if uh, with the consent agenda. Uh, if there's anything there, um, anybody wants to pull or review, or we can just approve as is. Uh, anybody want to make a motion to approve that? I'll make that, mo I'll make that motion. Approve the consent agenda. Yes. Second. All right, thank you. Uh, we'll just do a voice vote. Uh, we'll start over here, uh, Mary. Aye. Lori. Aye. Chris. Aye. Uh, Cal, aye. Yes. Jean. Yes. All right. Oh, and thank you, Lori, for the meeting minutes. You're almost caught up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next up is, uh, uh, Agenda item B1, uh, Harbor Director, uh, Departmental Updates. Thank you, Chair Myers and Advisory Board members. Um, I have been following somewhat of the same outline. I'm just gonna continue using that. It seems to have worked. So I'll start off with offshore wind and the activity that we've seen in the last month since the last meeting. Activity has been for the past, um, few months, a lot less than what we saw, you know, in the springtime, seems to have picked up again. Um, we have met twice with Equinor. They've been very active in communicating, or at least holding meetings. I think somewhat like the commercial fishermen, we, we don't get a lot out of those meetings, um, but they, they do like to hold them and bring people together and, and talk. Um, the other thing that's happening with all of the wind companies right now, and it was mentioned also, they're required to produce an agency communications plan. And so those plans go through a stakeholder process where everyone gets a chance to comment on them. I've been um, on the Zoom meeting with Golden State Wind 
Um, and, um, and the next meeting we have is with uh, Energize Ventures, which formerly was Invenergy. So all three companies will go through this process. Um, stakeholders get an opportunity to comment on it, um, as was mentioned. And then I believe very soon, I think possibly before the end of, or at least middle of October, they have to produce this document and it becomes a published um, document going forward. Basically what it is is how they're gonna communicate um, starting next year with the survey process all the way through decommissioning potentially 30 years from now. So it lays out exactly what their plans are. Um, and then on September 26th, I will be doing a presentation to a joint council planning meeting. I think it's around 3 p.m. on September 26th. Um, that is going to be a presentation kind of bringing everybody back to the same understanding of who are they um, and what they're doing, what their timeline is, and what we can kind of expect in the future. And then little by little, um, I believe council is requesting we just continue to provide more updates and information regarding what's happening uh, in our community. Um, the Harbor Dredge, I have no update. Same as in the past, we expect to have a standard dredge 2024, and then in 2025, we'll have the full Harbor Dredge. Um, I've commented on our budget and revenue for the past year, as well as the future year that we're currently in. Um, good news, well, I had reported that um, HDL, which is the company that provides data to the city and to the harbor regarding sales tax, and how uh, it appeared that revenue was heading down, um, not only for the city, uh, in relation to the entire state, but the harbor even more than the city. Um, the good news is um, we have, we don't have total numbers yet, but at the end of every year, June 30th, um, our master leaseholders are required to submit percentage rent for the prior year. Um, and we're actually significantly above percentage rent budget numbers. So I feel good about where we're gonna end up this year at the same time, we spent a lot of money this year, um, so we still may be in a break-even type position, but at least we're not in a negative position, or at least that's what my hope is. I've mentioned some of these items also. We, we have a $300,000 now with the help of the Mora Bay Commercial Fishing Organization. Um, we, well, we budgeted $200,000 to do commercial fishing dock repairs this year and they provided a grant of $100,000. So an additional $100,000, we now have a total of $300,000, um, and I believe there'll be more money available as we move forward with that. Um, I think I've mentioned that we have ordered a new replacement vehicle. $72,000 was provided by Measure E funds for that. Um, good news is, is we hope to receive delivery by 2023, which is really good news because January 1, the requirements probably would not allow us to purchase this type of vehicle in the future. There's new CARB requirements on municipal vehicles that are gonna make it really difficult and expensive to buy future vehicles. So we'll all be plugged in somewhere along the way. And then we plan to, we already have 50, approximately $50,000 budgeted to um, add the fire system that is planned for the Harbor Patrol vessel 3869. That's the new vessel that was commissioned several months ago, but the fire system hadn't been installed yet. So that's gonna be completed um, in the next few months. Give you some update on some of the infrastructure projects that we are working on. The DBW grant, I mentioned the last meeting that um, this is the boat ramp replacement grant, grant uh, that they continue to move the goalposts on us. And it's very concerning um, because the requirements that are being placed again create significant expense from a design and engineering standpoint. So we're sorting through that right now um, and we'll have to see where we go again, um, but it's significant dollars that um, it's gonna take to continue to move that project forward. Keep here. I've mentioned in the past, and, and you're aware that $1.5 million was appropriated um, through the federal government for repairs and maintenance to that 
here. Um, very interesting the way they work with their grants. These are um, what are called earmarks, appropriated funds. They, they give you the money before the, you tell them how you're going to use it. So now that we have it, we have to tell them how we're going to use it. But in order to do that, we really need some um, engineering expertise. So we have a company starting Monday uh, to go through another analysis um, to help us determine what the priorities should be and what the cost of those priorities will be so that we can let them know how much we're going to get done for the million and a half. And we plan to go back again in February to ask for additional funds to continue that project. Beach Street dock replacement, um, we're still in the design phase, no change with that. Um, I think you know the $80,000 that was appropriated last year for dock repairs was completed. And I just mentioned um, we're going to be moving forward with the uh, commercial fishing dock repair project with a minimum of $300,000, which will get us quite a bit of repairs done on that. The insurance claim and the FEMA um, claim for damages occurred during the winter storms is still in process. Uh, that is really led by Public Works. Um, we are supporting them when it comes to documentation. I'll let you know that today FEMA did a full day review of our commercial fishing docks. So they were here today with us, measuring, reviewing, um, and analyzing all of the damage. Um, next Tuesday, we will do another uh, full day review of all of the revetment in the harbor. So this is a good step forward, and hopefully um, we're going to have more information soon on, uh, on that claim. Regarding um, other projects that are in process, um, not necessarily um, ones that the harbor is in charge of, Public Works is in charge of a lot of these, but um, there is an RFP being prepared for a harbor facility assessment. Um, that's another assessment that needs to be done um, as a part of a new waterfront master plan. Um, that master, I should say, update to the waterfront master plan. Um, good news regarding that is, and you'll see it on Tuesday's council meeting, um, the harbor was not awarded, but offered pretty much a non-compete grant through the Coastal Commission for a half a million dollars to start the waterfront update. So that's all good news. That means uh, things are going to start, and they're going to start moving forward. I know, exactly. <laughs> Hard to believe. Um, so we're looking forward to that and supporting Public Works in, in getting that done. Um, and two things that I've requested is it, it does include um, our docks and revetment and actually a uh, onshore, um, what's it called? A was it a shipyard? Or? Shipyard, yeah. uh, just to see if that fits somewhere <laughs> in the proposal, um, as well as it is going to look at offshore opportunities and you know, what the potential is there, too. So, um, As far as our public facilities, the Harbor Office interior is 100% complete. If you haven't been there, um, it's, it's complete on the inside. I think it will shock you um, if you go in. Um, and if you haven't been by, and I don't want you to go by, um, the exterior is about 80% complete. So um, we're going to have a um, invitational open house um, to dignitaries in the community. Of course, that includes yourself. Um, we will be inviting you and hopefully you can make it. We we'll, might even have a little gift there for you. So we'll, we'll see how that, if you show up. Right, gotta be present to win. Um, anyway. So that's going to be, right now, it's looking at October 11th, but you'll get an invitation directly on that. Parking is on here for every one of these oral reports. Um, don't really have a date. We're expecting that that is going to move forward, at least through council and with the city manager. So I think you're going to see some action with that before the end of the year. Um, leaseholder relations, I've updated you on, you know, many, when I've said updated, I've given you the names of many of the different um, leases that we've worked with for different reasons. Um, we can't go into details on anything that's in closed session, as I've mentioned. Um, if it's already uh, hit 
their agenda, then it's public information and I, I can discuss those. But we have some that are coming up, such as Mora Bay Paddle Sports, the new COL form that you produced, and I apologize, I committed to bringing that back to you prior to it going to council and, and was directed to know that it would go to council first. So, um, and I don't know if they've published their agenda. So if the agenda is published today, you'll, you'll see that staff report in that form. The RFP is still in process for the lease sites 49, 50, 51. Um, those are the sites just south of uh, Associated Pacific. And um, we just made some minor parking modifications um, near the Harbor Hut, um, just in the sense that they have had issues with not having an area where guests, you know, customers can park for a few minutes to pick up food, as well as some of the other areas right there. So we're trying to accommodate that, and you'll see that there's been some couple of spaces marked off for that there now. Um, you have quite a bit of those timed zones down the Embarcadero, but when you get into those parking lot areas, there's less and less of that. So. Uh, the SCIF program, uh, you looked at it, hopefully, in the um, consent item. It was Becca's report. You know, and she mentioned in there, and I, I apologize, we all recognize that a lot of work was done. Um, there is still some more work that needs to be done. Um, the good news is, that, you know, the fee's there. Um, and it does appear, though, that we need to um, have some code changed um, in order to effectively put that into place. So it will definitely move up on our priority list. And, and now that we're moving out of summer, I think we can start looking at some of those items. Uh, and the Sal San Salvador visit I had mentioned here, 10,000 plus visitors, great, great, great event for the harbor, for the city, for the community. I think it was really wonderful and um, it's too bad they come only every six years. You couldn't <laughs> get them here sooner. And then just um, information, uh, if you haven't noticed, we've had a, just a number of large vessels visiting the harbor. We're really uncertain as to why that's happening so often. I think Mora Bay is on the map now, um, but we've had the Nomad, 180-foot vessel, um, Fulmar, 67-foot, uh, tri Tritium, Tritium, I don't know how that's pronounced, 72-foot, Souvenir, a 90-foot, and Firefly, 132-foot. Uh, so word is getting out there that we're a hot spot and they're gonna spend some time here. In fact, I just got a call today for a 200-foot vessel. <laughs> yeah, we can fit it on the pier. Yeah, if I could, um, those boats talk to each other. That crowd yeah, talks right. to each other. The you skippers go. all know each other. Right. So somebody comes to Morro Bay and their owner gets a great time at the wineries. Right. It spreads like wildflowers. Yeah, we've that. seen the limousines pick them up out of the, yeah. the dock too. <laughs> yeah, so probably more to come. Yeah, right, good point. And then my final item here, just to make you aware, um, and I just really learned this this week the harbor is applying for a grant for flares and hazardous material disposal events so that's happening in southern and northern california but really not in central california so um, hopefully if we anticipate being awarded this grant this will be an event that's held i think every year for a few years it's a multi-year it's a three-year contract in a sense grant where we would hold um, an annual event and accept you know, flares to be disposed of. It's very expensive um, not to collect them, it's expensive to dispose of them, and that all has to be done you know, through the state and certain requirements, so hopefully that's gonna happen real soon. We'll have some information on that. Yeah, um, and that concludes my presentation. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer those. Sure, any questions for the Harbor Director? Mary, Lori, go ahead. I was just gonna make a sarcastic comment. Does this mean I can stop shooting my flares off? <laughs> the expired ones on 4th of July? <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that, that would be really something for commercial fishing, because I mean, we have boxes and boxes of them at the ranch. Yeah, we do too. Yeah. You? Question, Mary? Yeah, I had two questions. Well, one comment, one question. Um, the first was thanks for the update on the skiff um, permits. 
And I was wondering if the follow-on ask would be, um, would it be possible to come to the next meeting with potentially a target date for kind of full implementation of the policy, um, like a timeline that you guys could put together and a goal to set? Um, because I do feel, you know, we're potentially leaving money on the table. And also I think this, this policy has like the dual positives where not only is it better for our environment to get some of these vessels um, either gone or permitted, um, but also it's revenue generating. So I just asked for a timeline there. Um, and then the other question I had was whether there was any update on the impact of the Ironman race um, to city revenues and potentially looking at whether they had kind of fulfilled the promises in that contract or whether we needed to renegotiate it. To my knowledge, the city has not received a report yet on that. I don't know what the holdup is. I know that it takes a while to determine and calculate, but it's still expected, and when it's produced, we'll make certain you get a copy. Comments, Sean? Yeah, I, I have a few questions um, to follow up on uh, Ted's uh, wonderful, uh, uh, comprehensive report. Uh, first up, uh, wind public comment opportunities. Uh, you said that there's on September 26th, there's a joint meeting of planning and council that you're going to update uh, the public on with the status of, of wind energy. I know sometimes there are ongoing studies that you know are really out of public view, uh, but there might be opportunities for the public to comment on things. Are there opportunities coming up for the public to comment on wind? Yeah, so th there are. It's <laughs> there's so much information coming out right now regarding just that. There's lots of documents. One of the things I will do um, in that presentation is mention the three or four published studies that are out there now and how you can access those. But there are some um, that. I think would be good for the general public as well as yourself to review those and see what the state, what the federal government, what BOEM um, reach. You know, they've all done studies. They all tell you different information about offshore wind. They have different, um, I guess, um, purposes of those studies. Um, but I am also, um, I'm not committing to this. I'm just letting you know part of my agenda with city council would be to produce a page on the city website that had links to a lot of the information that you're talking about so the general public can go there and basically see what's happening or what's coming up. Yeah, sim similar to what community development has done with the battery storage facility with some links perhaps. It's, yeah. a, it's a pretty good model for that. Um, I, I bring this up in part because the, the public speakers that mentioned um, commercial fishing it takes so much stamina, stamina to keep speaking publicly about these issues that you feel strongly about. So if there's any indication as to which meetings are the end all be all or the, the high leverage opportunities to publicly speak, any time, anything we can do to get the word out, uh, I think would be great. Um, uh, regarding the, um, the, the um, waterfront lease revenue, um, it looks like the HDL numbers are surprising us in a good way. Um, I, 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 I wanna bring up, the, the notion that uh, that we are consistently surprised by revenue numbers, uh, in part because uh, my understanding is that waterfront leaseholders continue to report only annually on that June 30th, as opposed to quarterly or monthly, as as uh, almost any other entity would be expected to do. Um, are there opportunities? Uh, um, I, I, I guess maybe I'll, I'll ask: Are do do our our already negotiated leases preclude us from from uh, more frequent reporting or more frequent submission uh, of revenue, uh, given that most master leaseholders are collecting rent from their uh, their subten or their tenants uh, on a monthly basis, including gross percent uh, revenue that then is held mysteriously for 11 months up to. Yeah, the, the leases determine how how we can do that. So until we go into m new leases. Or, or renewals or amendments, um, there's no opportunity to, to do it any differently. And of course, I know we'll have a brief update. Well, we, we're, we're going to be having another um, ad hoc committee, I think you're aware. Should I mention that right now, or were you planning to no, go ahead. talk about that? So um, the council had directed the harbor to initiate a joint um, committee, uh, ad hoc committee of HAB and CFAC 
Um, we've selected two members already. Um, Cal and Mary are going to be the HAB members and then two members from CFAC. And they're gonna be looking at specific issues of the lease policy that affect revenue to the harbor. We're not gonna be redoing the whole policy, but some specific ones, that would be one hopefully that would be identified and, and looked at, you know, what would be a better alternative to that. But as far as making any changes, you know, until the lease renews, there's not an option for us. Okay. Um, Harbor Department interior looks awesome. It, it, it long overdue. I, I, when I saw that the other day, I was just so happy that <laughs> our folks have somewhere to sit or stand if you have a standing desk um, in uh, relative peace and comfort. Um, the, uh, uh, I think I'll skip that. The, um, the, the uh, city council agenda item next Tuesday um, regarding um, the subcommittee or the, uh, the ad hoc committee's um, sort of waterfront master lease renewal uh, process that's going to council. Um, who, who's presenting that to council? I believe Scott Graham. So are you, are you, are you talking about the, the uh, request the to accept the grant funds or apply for the grant funds? No, 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 the, uh, the, the, the Jean Mary um, uh, Cherise. COL. Yeah, the consent of landlord. Landowner. Oh, that, that's my staff report. Okay, so you're, you're presenting that on Tuesday to so council. It's a, it's a consent item. There's no presentation, um, but it'll be published, you know, today, potentially by the end of the day. It's published now, so you can, you'll be able to see that. Okay. And um, any of you are welcome, if you, you know, have my email to reach me. If you have any questions, even over the weekend, I can... So it's ba I guess my, my main question is that it's being presented as uh, uh, guidance or recommendations by the ad hoc committee of Harbor Advisory Board, not uh, with the endorsement of Harbor Advisory Board as a whole. It's being, so what, what occurred with that process is your recommendations to the Harbor Director and the Harbor Director's recommendation to council. It's not 100%, um, it's very close, and a lot of the um, design of that COL um, occurred during that process with the help of the committee as well as the help of, um, in this case, Jean uh, was very much involved along with um, Kathy um, and helped formulate how to take your recommendations and place them into a form. I very much want to thank sure everyone on that, that committee who put in that, uh, yeah. that work to make and that I think, happen. I think what you did, and I, I think... Um, What's good about the form is it takes um, the penalty away from um, developers who don't have control over certain issues. Um, and, and I think that's a much more fair way to, yeah. to go forward. I, yeah, I just very much ad uh, appreciate that the process has, has moved forward. Um, uh, I, I did sort of pull myself off of that. I just want to put, kind of go out on record as I, I sort of pulled myself off of that uh, that committee to working on that committee when it was initially proposed with the hope that a document would be looked at at the Harbor Advisory Board level. Uh, so uh, I don't know what's, I haven't seen the council agenda, so I don't necessarily personally endorse it, but I look forward to reading it and seeing where it goes. Thank you very much. Yeah. Gene or Chris, any questions, comments? I just have two quick uh, ones. Uh, on the t -pier, uh, the 1.5 million you talked about, there were some other design studies. They, they give you the money and then ask you how you're gonna spend it. In the design piece, is that design reviews, consultant fees, is that covered into the 1.5 or is that money that comes out of your no, budget? No, that's, <laughs> that's part of the way these grants work. No, that's not covered. You spend your money first? Yeah, they, you, gotcha. gotta, you gotta, t in order to release the money, you have to produce a document that gives them these specifications and in order to do that, yeah. We're not capable. We, we need the input. Yeah. And I assume it's similar with the boat ramp grant as well. Um, yeah. Did you say it's the same? Oh, reimbursable. Yeah. There, theirs is, a lot of theirs is reimbursable. But you still have to spend the money up front. Right. In our case, the, the money we're spending to this consultant is not reimbursable. Understood. Yeah. As a with the past harbor director, it was one of the items was to keep some money reserved just for these purposes to, you know, spend a hundred grand to get a million or whatever those right. taller numbers were. That's all I have. Um, any other questions, last chance? It's public comment.
Uh, go ahead, Lori. I'm sorry, could you repeat um, the Beach Street slips? Did you say they were in the design process? Correct. Okay. They're, they're still in design. Yeah, so that, that was a project that started again before me. It's been in design and right. in permitting. Um, it's still in the design phase. And there's no grant opportunity um, for that dock right now. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, with that, we'll go ahead and open up item B1, the departmental updates to public comment. Anybody in the audience have a public comment about that? No? AGP, is there anybody in the audience that has their hand raised? Thank you, Chair Myers. There are currently no raised hands in the queue. Thank you. With that, we'll go ahead and move on to B2, which is the ad hoc committee for the uh, commercial vessel fees. Uh, I think, uh, Mary, you were going to speak to that? Yeah, um, so for this one, I've started to have preliminary conversations um, with some um, neighboring ports in similar situations. So for example, one of the conversations was with Santa Barbara um, Harbor. They kind of have a similar situation where they will have crew transfers from the offshore oil um, as well as they have liveaboards within their harbor and um, recreation and tourism as part of their harbor. So um, I've started kind of conducting exploratory calls with that. Um, and I think we're on track and planning to provide a, um, a line as an ad hoc committee and provide a recommendation at the next meeting. All right, thank you, Mary. Chris, any other comments on that? Okay. Uh, I'll go ahead and uh, any questions for the ad hoc, Ted? Um, will that, um, is, your, is your analysis looking at, um, you're looking at commercial vessels, right? Is there any um, part of that looking at large vessels like we're seeing also um, as to whether or not we might need to update any of those particular fees? Um, yeah, what we, I touched on that um, in the conversations and we can provide that as well. Um, I would be interested, I don't know if it's appropriate to ask now, but um, to share with people when you do see the Nomad and similar types of larger vessels, are there unique demands on the Harbor Department um, to support those um, types of tenants? Yeah, I mean, you might see it more than I do. I mean, I know we're involved in their, you know, departure and arrival. Um, they've called on us for numerous reasons, right? I'm not, maybe you can talk to some of that. I think Harbor staff will have to, you know, move vessels to accommodate for the size, move them off the T pier, move them to another T pier. So definitely there's uh, special accommodations required for those larger vessels. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, our analysis, I think, is primarily looking at what are the fees that other kind of similar situations are charging, and then also what are some of the um, unique impacts that those types of vessels have um, for Morro Bay and our goals that we have around tourism and recreation and things like that. All right, thank you. Any questions for that ad hoc? Gene, Sean? Okay. All right, with that, we'll conclude the B2. We will open up to public comment. Any public comment in the audience? No? All right, AGP, is there anybody on the phone that would like to make a public comment? Thank you, Chair Myers. There are currently no raised hands in the queue. All right, uh, last item on the agenda is item B3, which is the uh, ad hoc for liability um, and uh, actually changes to potentially changes to the uh, municipal code. Um, Chris and I have been on that one. I'll give an update here. Um, it's it was actually been quite interesting. Uh, ended up talking to a variety of, of, of different harbors and some of the folks up in City Hall, the staff. I have a, some notes. I'll try to keep it relatively. Uh, um, Brief, but uh, it's actually was uh, a lot of things I expected, a lot of things I didn't expect. Um, to make changes to the city code is, is 
that's simple, but it's fairly straightforward, uh, according to our city attorney, Chris <coughs> Newmeyer. Um, did talk to uh, our city clerk, Dana Swanson, about specifically around, um, well, actually, let me back up. Generally, what our goal was is to look at you know, public safety and around the water and, and address any potential liability issues. So jumping off the pier, you know, swimming in the channel, getting run over by a boat, uh, also uh, liability insurance potentially for the vessel owners in the harbor. Um, again, we talked to Chris just to make sure that we didn't go down any path that was, that we couldn't, weren't, wasn't achievable from a liability or legal perspective. I did talk to Dana uh, about the insurance and any lawsuits that have occurred and uh, the city has had a number of you know, injury, personal injury lawsuits over the years, but none of them were associated with the types of things that we're talking about. Again, nobody broke a, f a leg jumping off the pier that at least had made it to the lawsuit level. Um, I haven't talked to the harbor, what's Becca's title? Uh, I haven't talked to Becca to ask her if, if she's seen any you know injuries in those areas or rescues or anything but I don't, none of them have bubbled up to a lawsuit against the city. Um, I ended up talking to three different um, harbors, uh, staff there, uh, Monterey and Santa Cruz were very, very similar uh, in their approach. They, uh, at least for the, the, the municipal code, those types of things, uh, they had a, very, a lot of signage, enforcement, uh, it's sworn officers, so both of those facilities had their harbor department carried sidearms uh, with enforcement. Uh, they, uh, it was quite an ordeal. As a matter of fact, one gentleman I talked to at Santa Cruz, his job was putting up the signs and he kind of joked about it. It's, it's a lot of work to have the signs consistent. You know, you have to have them, you know, if there's, there's a sign here and a sign here, that means if you can jump off the pier here, it's okay. Um, so you have to end up putting signs everywhere uh, for that. Their, their harbors are quite busy um, so it really is a safety issue. They have had issues with people getting hurt. Uh, again, it's a lot more tourism, a lot more stuff there. And also their harbor isn't, it's not some place you'd really want to swim anyway, just because it's, it is very busy. There's larger boats there. Um, um, and they, like I say, they have had injuries. Uh, there was some discussion about sworn officers. Uh, I, the one gentleman said that they had to be sworn officers. I didn't fully understand the implications on there, uh, but wanted to bring it back here to see if that's a, a rabbit hole that we would have to go down if we wanted to put enforcement stuff there. So um, when you when you say that, because we talked about it earlier, and, mm -hmm. and I know you're mentioning it again, are you saying in terms of enforcement to be a f sworn officer or? I, I was, it wasn't clear, and I was trying to be respectful of, of those times, but I, I mentioned that uh, you know, we were thinking about putting these similar things in place, and then his question back was, are those people sworn officers? Uh, it was beyond my knowledge. I just said, I, you know, I don't know. He said, basically, they are if they carry a gun. And so I left it there. Um, it would be something that you know, if we decide to go down this path, there is a could be a significant cost of not just the signs, but changing the roles of the Harbor Department. Officers. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure we would review that, but they, they have enforcement authority now in the Harbor, so they can enforce different code. Yeah, I, like I say, so it's beyond my knowledge. Yeah, I just knew I, that I'm it was sure we'll, we'll confirm that, sure. but I, I don't think that's gonna be a stumbling block. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm gonna, uh, we're going to talk about insurance in one fall swoop at the end, but the other one that was interesting was Noyo Harbor, which is just south of Fort Bragg. Um, they didn't have, they're like us, they don't have any rules in place for that. Um, that place is extremely undesirable. I don't know why anybody in their God's mind would jump off a pier. I, it's a cool place, but I wouldn't want to jump off a pier to go, here I'd jump off the pier to go swim across the bay possibly. I mean, it's attractive. There's nothing in that bay that looks attractive you want to swim to, other than maybe a thrill seeker. Um, they haven't really had any issues with that. Uh, their biggest problem is fishing off the pier, um, and they you know, uh, go after that. Um, so they don't really have any rules with that. They don't see that as a big issue for that particular harbor. It's probably really cold water too, so. Um, 
Insurance uh, was pretty consistent. Uh, nobody, they all have issues with insurance. They would love to get some liability insurance like we described, um, but they've had issues with that. Uh, Noyo Harbor in particular, they charged a added a fee if you didn't have insurance. It was a couple hundred bucks probably annually. Um, and they ended up rescinding it after about the second year because somebody thought that that meant they had insurance now. So the city was providing, or the harbor was providing them insurance by paying this fee, and that was not the case. Um, fortunately, they didn't. It didn't like end up in court with a boat sunk or anything like that. But some of the people that from the harbor thought, "Well, I have insurance. I paid you three hundred dollars a year for it." And that wasn't the case. Um, so that was still kind of an open issue. Um, if 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 the change to the code was to mandate insurance. Um, we would have to give folks an avenue, and that was one of the conversations I had with the city clerk, Dana, was there's a potential that the city could be an insurer of last resort. Um, uh, I, I tried to do that in an email with Dana, and we just didn't connect, and so that's a follow-up. So if that is something that, you know, do you want to in insure everybody in there and just add it to their bill or insure individual vessels if they're unable to obtain, obtain it? So it was, it was kind of an interesting uh, piece. Um, so that's kind of where we're at with that. Uh, looking for a little direction. Oh, Chris, if you had any other comments here. Not at this point. Okay. Uh, go ahead and open it up to council questions, Gene. Yeah, I have quite a few comments, <laughs> I guess. It seems that Morro Bay has, has promoted the intense use of our harbor, our bay, and we've made it basically an aquatic park. And I have issues with prohibiting swimming in the bay. I see people swimming in the HU area, off the Tidelands Dock area, Coleman Beach, um, out uh, north of, excuse me, south of the rock itself there. Quite a few people swim in the bay, uh, more than you would realize. I do understand there'd be a concern about swimming down the middle of the channel, maybe with a tow buoy would be acceptable. But um, I see prohibiting swimming I just can't accept that in, in, in Morro Bay. Um, as far as insurance on the boats, um, there are a lot of wooden boats that just cannot be insured, and Rory can understand that also. Um, if you are in a public dock or a public city slip and the, the city required you have insurance, I don't have any problem with that. But if you're in a private marina or on a private mooring, um, I would think it's up to the private owner of that morning or the marina to require insurance if they want. And that's that's my take on it, so. Yeah, the, the one comment I'll make about the swimming in the bay, I, I didn't really include it in here, but I informally told a few friends that I was working on this and it was consistent with that feedback from any of the locals that you know, water usage was, um, you know, it's just part of the culture here. So that would be some community pushback uh, on that uh, if we were to go down that path. But again, that was totally informal. Uh, questions, Lori? Yeah, I have a couple questions. <clears throat> the liability, are you talking that each vessel has liability insurance for? Per boat. Per boat, per for dumb people, or for it, just in the, case the we goal, get something? The goal was to make sure that the city was covered or, you know, not, not the boat itself per se, um, but some sort of insurance that if something happened, the boat sunk, if it, you know, got untied and crashed into something else that people couldn't sue the city, they would have to sue that insurance company. <laughs> well, if we don't get our docks fixed, that well. could be happening, but that's a bad subject, so sorry. Because um, a lot of the commercial vessels in Morro Bay are privately insured, we have, well, we're the United Trawlers Fund where we self-insure each other. And I don't even know if that's possible. Mm -hmm. That's. Yeah, I just, it, it, it is one of those ones that nobody's solved locally that I talked to. So it was sort of, uh, it was an interesting voyage, so to speak. Um, okay. And then my next question, when you're talking about the enforcement, are you talking about our Harbor Patrol packing guns now? 
that was the takeaway that I got from that conversation. His title was deputy, so I have to assume that his he was sort of biased in that respect. So I didn't know the scope of his duties compared to like what Becca and the crew do. So I'm not sure that kind of stopped that because that that would be a big change to their role if they had. To it kinda, would be, yeah. and I, I believe Santa Barbara is, yeah. and they it's very off putting. Yeah. Can I speak to a couple of those? I'm sorry, because sure, the last ahead. thing I want is that to get out in the community that yeah, we're looking no, at adding you. guns to. No, that, no, that is not in the plans. No, no, no I discussion. Had, yep. There, there's absolutely no need for our harbor patrol to to carry weapons. They have enforcement authority without carrying a weapon, so that's not not part of the plan. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. That, that just thought the thought of that just yeah, horrified me. Yeah, I it, it, ditto. <laughs> I was like, no. Ditto. Yep, I, I totally understand. Um, Chris, Bor or Mary, any other questions, comments? Anything else? Yeah, so I, I do have a, I wanna talk about insurance. Um, you know, there's there's two parts to insurance. There's liability, which covers everyone else, not, not you, the owner of the vessel. Well, it covers you from being sued, um, but it doesn't cover any damages to your vessel. It doesn't cover um, theft. It doesn't cover sinking. It doesn't cover fire, all of those issues. And there's comprehensive, and you have this on your car, which covers you for an accident, damage to your car, damage you know, to property, um, those sorts of things. Um, so the harbors that have a requirement for insurance, it's strictly liability. Liability, and I, I do encourage you, Cal, to call as many insurance companies as you can and ask them specifically about liability insurance and who they will exclude. Um, there may be some that would exclude liability if you're a wooden vessel. I haven't found that yet. Um, uh, that's typically covered because it's a liability. It's not the vessel. It's nothing to do with the vessel sinking, catching fire, um, you know, all of those issues. It's strictly about covering that vessel owner for damage they might do uh, to property or a person. And in that case, because they name the harbor as additional insured, that protects us. Because you know as soon as they do that, um, they're looking for the deepest pockets. And the deepest pockets are gonna be the city. And so the city's gonna be named in that lawsuit. That liability policy protects the city. Um, if right now, if a vessel runs over somebody, swimming across the channel, not in the bay, but just across the channel, um, um, that vessel owner's gonna get sued. And if they don't have a liability, um, the harbor's gonna be named in that lawsuit and there's no coverage to protect us in a typically multi-million dollar lawsuit. So that's, that's, what, that's why the reason the, you know, the harbors do this. Plus, in the state of California, every liability policy has a minimum of a million dollars um, pollution policy. And that's another issue too. If the vessel sinks, if it's damaged and you know, all of a sudden the fuel is all over the harbor, um, that protects the vessel owner, but it also protects the harbor from a potential fine for that particular spill, so. Yeah, I just wrote our check for our pollution policy. Um, this is kind of off the topic question, but kind of not. When people come down the docks, like this weekend, we had quite a few visitors that may or may not have been inebriated just because they were holding their glasses of wine. Um, are they covered? Is the city covered when people do that, when they ignore the signs? Well, the city's general liability policy is gonna cover all city property. And in that case, it's city property. It's not your property. Now, if they trip over something you've laid out on the dock, you could be brought into that lawsuit. Um, but the city's general liability policy covers everything that the city operates, any property that we would have. How about those who've left um, donations of alcohol on our boat? And Seriously, that happened this weekend. Yeah. <laughs> we had a couple of cans of mojitos and something else. I'm like, when did you start drinking mojitos? Uh, but I was like, okay. But um, Cal, what I was, uh, I'm sorry, Lori. I'm just saying, it just yeah. was like. I don't know if that'll be. The, we just, it just that tells me that explosion. people are down there on the docks, sure. doing things they shouldn't be. Right. Yeah. Um, but I do encourage you to call as many different insurance companies as you can. 
Sure. Um, you know, Towboat, uh, Towboat US um, is a major insurer of vessels, and I've never seen them turn away um, a policy. So find out. I think it's pretty much available sure. to anybody that needs it. And it's not the most expensive part of your policy. The comprehensive piece of a policy is, is really where the cost is. Do you, do you think the assistant city manager would be the right person to ask it, who in, in the city would know? Like, I, I know if you go to the, if you rent out the, uh, the senior center for an event, you have to name, you, you have to be named additionally insured. There's yeah. probably someone at the city staff level that would know every venue or entity in the city that it's comparable to what we're discussing here. You, you mean in terms of providing insurance? Not providing, uh, what, what other, what comparables other than our, our let's say our, our docks, does the city require that? For, for events and stuff, you do. For, for specific, like one-off events for sure, um, it's other venues, pretty much everything. Yeah, I mean like an Iron Man event, you know, the major events, there's insurance policy. Yeah, I was supposed to talk to Dana about that, we just never, connected okay. on a specific topic. Yeah. Again, I needed to speak and with her. It doesn't mean a lawsuit's not going to happen, and it doesn't mean the city's not going to yeah. pay out of pocket, but it's it's that first layer of protection. Yep. All right. Any other questions on the insurance liability codes? All right. Well, that's B3, public comment. Uh, nope. Really. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Didn't think so. That's why we put it at the end. AGP, is there anybody on the phone that would like to make a public comment? Thank you, Chair Myers. There are currently zero attendees. Or oh, you'd have to say it like that. <laughs> 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 Nobody raised their hand. Um, okay, with that, we'll go ahead and close the business items declaration of future agenda items. Um, one thing I would like to have, Lori, is uh, we talked about it. We have a, have a list somewhere of all the future agenda items we have had. Can we have a, a future agenda item to review the future agenda items? Maybe strike a few out or see if, sure, okay. Would that be something that you guys might be interested in? Um, I, people brought up stuff before and we've I, never kind of, they never kind of make it on. I mean, I, I, I'd love to be updated every once in a while or just simply see our list of approved like like sort of consensus future agenda items rolled over, which I think they used to do. Yeah. Have it. Just maybe just included in the agenda. Mm -hmm. Do you need like a vote? Do you have, we have three. Was uh, anybody else can, interested? Yeah. Okay. I think that would be be just something to look at that we would yeah. give some thought for before the meeting. So. Okay. Which is just you. Yeah. 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 Okay. And I think with that, we'll go ahead and wrap up adjournment. Uh, thank you for attending and everybody's uh, council uh, appearance this time. Thanks. Enjoy the rest of the evening. <laughs>